Hi, my name is Josh Christ, and this is Omni Athlete, the podcast for athletes and coaches who want to learn from the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it's time to join us on our quest to unlock sport as a transformational human experience. You're listening to Omni Athlete. Welcome to another episode of Omni Athlete. You're here because, like us, you believe that sport is a vehicle for elevating global consciousness. But you know that elevating consciousness through sport only matters if it actually helps you to compete at your highest level. We created this show to empower your performance with the wisdom and techniques of the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors. Okay, so today's guest is a third degree black belt in jujitsu a Stanford grad, a current head coach, and former All-American tennis player who played professionally in Europe after his college career. After taking over for perhaps the greatest coach in collegiate tennis history, he hasn't missed a beat and has led the Rainbow Warriors to three Western Athletic Conference titles, one Big West Conference title, and four NCAA tournament appearances since becoming their head coach. Prior to his current position, he led the San Diego State Aztecs to three straight Mountain West regular season titles from 2000 to 2002 and guided them to the NCAA tournament five out of his last six years at the home. He's been named the Mountain West Conference Coach of the Year, Western Athletic Conference Coach of the Year, and has coached one singles player and three sets of doubles teams to national championships. It's my pleasure to introduce to Omni Athlete, the head coach of men's tennis at the University of Hawaii, John Nelson. Welcome to the show, John. Oh, thank you very much. Happy to be here. <laughs> so one of the, the pieces of your story that I found really interesting and where I would love to start is the feeling you had taking over at the University of Hawaii for a coach uh, in your predecessor who many may consider to be the greatest collegiate tennis coach of all time. What was that process like? And specifically, as it relates to what we talk about here on Omni Athlete, what were some of the values that you wanted to bring into the program when you joined? Well, you know, Jim Squitters uh, did an unbelievable job here. He coached 38 years, coached men's tennis, women's tennis, coach uh, PE classes and uh, on a shoestring budget, they did not have a great facility. So when he was retiring, they were building a new complex, 12 beautiful courts, and they were going to make a commitment to the travel budget. So I've always seen Hawaii as a sleeping giant, like I saw each school I've been at. So um, I found out the day before it closed from a friend in Idaho that it was open. So I put in for it. And my whole career, I've always gone into a program that hasn't uh, been given a lot and tried to, you know, go for it, excel. I don't make excuses. I just go for it. So I I thought, wait a minute, I get to do what I love in paradise. I'd be blessed. So I went for it. Mm. (laughs) So what were, what were some of the, the core values that you brought with you when you joined and what were some of the, or what are some of the core values that have evolved since you've been in Hawaii? You know, uh, Number one, I'm a Christian, uh, so basically, um, you know, there's more important things than just sport. I'm an educator. Uh, I got a master from Stanford in education and I graduated in 79. And I've been fortunate because every school I started at the high school level, coached girls and boys tennis at the high school level, came out of grad school, coached at the community college level, then went Division two with no scholarships. And I was told, hey, you can't compete with no scholarships, without cheating, and I won't cheat. <laughs> There's no shortcut. <laughs> and so uh, I, I had players that didn't e- either me- mentally, technically, or physically have, you know, the strengths they've been told their whole life they can't do it. And I tend to focus on what their God-given talents are, what they can do, and I change their mindset as far as stop worrying about winning, use your strengths, and uh, uh, apply, you know, look for the solution, not the problem. So uh, I'm a competitor. I have a twin, identical twin brother, competed my whole life in everything I've ever done. Wow. And so you tell me I can't do something and I go, oh, great. <laughs> it's almost like a shot in the arm of adrenaline. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. So <laughs> every program I've been at, I've been blessed. I've been gone into a good program and been able to take it to another level. But I try to surround myself people with like mind, people that really want to work, want to learn. They're not content because I found once you're content in life, you're done. So it's that 
you know, the old thing, determination, breathe, concentration. I look for people that are driven. They got that chip on their shoulder. It's like, hey, uh, I can do this. I want to do this. Show me how. And those are the people I've been able to build uh, programs at everywhere I've been at. So, you know, you surround yourself with winners. It makes you look good. But I didn't win a point for any of these guys. So, What would you say, John, has been the biggest component of building that mindset, whether it's for you or for some of the, the players and people you've been fortunate enough to work with? What are some of the the pieces of building that mindset that really make a difference when you come into a program? Uh, you know, and and I'll just say in general, when you are coaching, what are areas of that mindset you really try to focus on helping the players and the program improve? You know, um, having an identical twin brother growing up, we were in uh, junior high school, and I had uh, being identical twins. We'd always been in the same class. Our parents dressed us like when we were kids. And the psychologist came in and said, hey, you're stifling their creativity and you've got to separate them. Well, we are, we both love math. We used to do all the, you know, flashcards, math games, and we were highly competitive. Sure. And they decided to separate us. They put me in a slower math class and immediately I knew that I was in a slower math class. My grades dropped mm. and my brother continued doing well in the class we had been at. And, you know, I, uh, growing up, I realized I was living up to expectations and my parents went in, complained. I ended up getting moved back into the math class. But, you know, unless you're an extremely strong willed, you listen to other people, people, oh, your ranking or your results or this, you're not that good. Well, yeah. everyone's got God given talent. So no two athletes in any sport that play the same, but you got to apply the proper physics. And that's where jujitsu comes in. It doesn't matter how big and strong someone is. They grab you. They're attacking. Trust me, there's a weakness. We break their amount, uh, their balance, or we distract the mind. So we always look for solutions, not the problems. In real street fighting, you don't get to stretch out and warm up, and you don't. Oh, you outweigh me by fifty pounds. You just look for what's the solution. And being a peace lover, being a Christian, I don't want to hurt people. When the nice thing is, it gave you options to subdue people. So in tennis, it's like life. You basically. Tennis teaches about life. It's a stressful situation. What's the solution? Stop looking at the problem. Apply your strengths, your skills to the situation. And in any dojo, we create an environment that's conducive to learning. There's a lot of fear of being hurt or fear of this. And if there's an environment that, hey, you're helping me become a better martial artist. You're helping me become a better tennis player. Basically, I don't ever get angry if the guys lose. I'll get angry at them if they don't try the right stuff. So they know... The rule is, if you do the right thing, you won't hear from me. If you're doing the wrong thing, you're going to hear from me. So in the end, they're happy not to hear from me if, they, if they're doing the right thing. And doubles if they poach. They miss the shot. Hey, I'm proud of you. Took courage to do the right thing. You know, next time, what was your purpose? You know, catch it and hit a spot or try to end the point or hit hard. So, so much of it is the mindset. Your mind is by far your best weapon. And that's what I love about the martial arts. It teaches that. It's not the physical prowess. It's stop worrying what everybody thinks and everybody says. It has nothing to do with what you're doing. So I threw a lot at you there. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, it's amazing, John. No problem at all. I, I uh, So just for context, I'm a, a martial artist as well and uh, trained my entire life. And what I would love to know is what got you started in the martial arts and why jujitsu? Why did that art, why did you gravitate towards it? And what, what it, what made you stick with it? The funny thing about it was having a twin brother and let's face it, you, you grab each other and rolled your whole life. <laughs> and we got, we got into wrestling in seventh grade and my father happened to heard about a demonstration going on. And we went to a dojo in Mountain View and there was like, they were punching and kicking and throwing each other and choking. And we looked at each other. That looks like fun, you know. <laughs> and uh, we got into jiu-jitsu. And then Aikido was being taught there. And my sense that the art was passed on to Sigfrey Kukaraf. He taught hand-to-hand combat in the U.S. Army in 1944. Now, he was half German, half Japanese. And obviously, there was racism in Hawaii. He was living here in Hawaii. He was in the U.S. Army. And the drill sergeant said, hey, uh, I'm looking for a volunteer. Well, the first thing you learn in the military, don't volunteer. No one volunteered. So they said, Siegfried Kufarev, come on up. Not a big guy. Everyone laughed because they knew the drill sergeant was going to hurt him. 
Well, Sig defend himself, broke the guy's arm. If you check online, 1944, Sig Kufarov was teaching hand-to-hand combat to the U.S. Army. <laughs> and then there's only three Caucasians that ever studied with the founder of Aikido, and he was teaching at the same dojo. Obviously, like minds attract. So I was, my twin brother and I were going six days a week, three wow. days jiu-jitsu, three days Aikido. And then as I got older, my sensei always said, go into any dojo. So I did a little Brazilian jiu-jitsu, some Shotokan, Taekwondo, Judo, Kali, Philippine stick fighting. Go in as a white belt, act like you don't know anything and learn. Because as Bruce Lee always said, if your cup is full, you're not going to, you can't add anymore. Go in and act like you don't know anything. And all of a sudden you start realizing it's balance, it's movement, the, the physics are the same. Mm-hmm. It's the art of winning. Street fighting is the art of winning. And being a Christian, I love people. I don't want to hurt people. But the beauty of it is in jiu-jitsu, Aikido, you can subdue and mobilize without having to hurt people. But then if it's a survival mode, you can end it. You know, you assume we're trained from day one. You assume everybody knows more than you. So you never, ever underestimate anybody. They always know more than you. So if some guy bumps into you, excuse me, I didn't see you. Sorry. You know, where if, oh, um, testosterone, that kind of stuff causes lots of problems. Because today, people have guns and knives. You get in a fight, you might win that fight. The next day, they'll run you over and shoot you. So it's like, uh, lose the ego. And that's one of the things I found in tennis or in life. The ego, I'm better than you. No, you're not. Just apply the right thing. And here's a, here's a situation. You know, in street fighting with a knife, if you worry about dying or you worry about, you know, not getting stabbed, fear inhibits you. Hmm. Basically, it's so impersonal. You do this, I'm doing this. Oh, you're doing this, I'm doing this. Well, that's why I teach tennis is, hey, you're coming in, you hit an approach that I'm doing this. I have a solution for everything you do. And the guys that have bought into the discipline, they lose the ego. They stop worrying about winning. They stop worrying what other people think. They've been trained in practice. They do this, you do this. And at times I've been fortunate. Guys have bought in and they've gone on to opportunity to, you know, win the conference, win national titles, beat some of the best guys in the country. Yeah. So I know it works because it's been passed down for a couple thousand years. It's not my philosophy. I sold everything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so well, uh, there, there are a couple pieces, John, that I want to unpack there. And it's incredible. Uh, very energizing. One of the things that, that I think I'd like to start with is the art of winning. So what do you mean by that? Well, losing on the street is dying. <laughs> right. So that's future. You know, if I'm going to get stabbed, I'm going to die. Well, that's future. Well, concentration is a skill and all concentration is being in the moment. I tell the guys, Hey, you know, when you're reading a book, think about how many chapters you have to go or think what you read in the last paragraph. Can you read? No. Well, concentration is a skill like hitting a forehand, like hitting a serve. And, uh, so learning to be in the moment and Learning to, uh, when your mind goes to, when you're uh, meditating, when you're relaxing, your mind, or you're playing a match or anything, your mind will go to the future. Good Lord, if I win this match, I get to go to the next round. Or in the past, gee, last time I was up 5-4 serving for this match, uh, for a match, I lost. Well, the old saying, divide and conquer, you've got to be in the moment. Are you doing what you're supposed to do? And what's your purpose? Why am I doing this? You know, in knife fighting, if you look at the knife, you the hand's quicker than the eye, you're stabbed. <laughs> so yeah. you don't look at the knife. You look at the center of the body, the knife's in the right hand, the right shoulder's coming, the knife's coming. And no matter how good you are, you can block 50 shots. So you're going to block and go to take the person out. So the art of winning is looking for the solution and doing what you should be doing. Fear will inhibit you physically and mentally. You won't act right. You won't think right because of fear. So you train to the point you stop worrying about the future and you have a solution. You're doing this. I'm doing this. You're bigger and stronger. Well, guess what? If you're off balance or I distract your mind, you're weaker. You have people grab your wrist. And if I move back or forward a couple inches, move their head, they're off balance. They're physically weak. But when they stay centered, they're really strong. You don't move them and you make a quick move like you're going to go to the eyes immediately they stop thinking about their arms and thinking about their eyes. You distract the mind. 
So in tennis, you can get them off balance or you distract the money by moving forward, doing the unexpected, whatever it is. So that's true in all sports. You know, in golf or baseball, you're worried about getting on base or winning or you're worried about not hitting in the out of bounds or the hazard. Whatever you focus on is tend to what you tend to do. Don't get stabbed, you're going to get stabbed. <laughs> so it's, it's unbelievable training. But the atmosphere conducive to learning. There's no fear. You're helping me become a better martial artist. You, people never play their best tennis when someone's playing when they're not as good. When they're really good and they're playing their best tennis, that is the time that you go. They're taking you to another level. Instead of being angry at them, you're appreciative of the situation. So how do you respond? You know. So today with the uh, Facebook and the image and all that stuff, it's so counterproductive and. I just, I focus on just doing what you should do and find your strengths, your tendencies, you know, no two people the same in personality, strength, timing, musculature, having a twin brother, you know, we're very, very identical, but we didn't play exactly the same because personality is a little different. I hope that answered it. Kind of. <laughs> I, absolutely. So how does discipline play a role in overcoming that fear that you're talking about having uh, the ab ability to inhibit performance? How does discipline play a role in that? Uh, great question. I always define discipline as do what you should do every single time you do it to the best of your ability. Well, two weeks from now, the best of your ability is going to be better, but you don't practice when you're practicing with knives and it's a rubber knife and you're my buddy and I'm being cool. Look how good. I no, no, no. In your mind, it's a real knife, and you're really trying to stab me, so I'm going to do what I should do to the best of my ability. And all of a sudden, you start, you stop worrying about anything, but uh, you're doing this. Well, I'm doing this. Uh, you're doing this. Uh, I'm doing this. Here's your attack. Here's the solution. So, you know, like I train the guys for the fastest ball on the ground strokes, on the return of serve, on the volleys. And when I was at San Diego State, Tony Gwynn was in the next office to me. I was very blessed because he's one of the best hitters of all time. Ted Williams and here were the two best hitters of all time. They both said they trained themselves for the fastball. Hmm. Well, I played baseball seven years, organized baseball, and shortstop. But you don't get your mitt there at the last second. You get, you get your body behind the ball. And uh, striking. If I, if I take a left lead, you better be ready for the left jab in street fighting. They're going for your eyes the left kick going for your groin. And if you're not trained for the fastest technique, you're in trouble. So training has a lot to do with it. Harry Hopman, one of the best coaches of all time, he dominated when he had labor, Emerson Newcomb. And he made practice so much tougher than competition. And the more, in the dojo, same thing. All the best dojos, I've said a lot of different arts, the best senseis always trained you. There was, there was respect, there's humility, but there was no ego. And if you ever were talking or not looking at the sense he was talking, uh, when he was talking, you'd be doing push-ups or he'd call you up in front and throw you a dozen times. <laughs> and you learn, one, respect for authority, but two, how to focus on what they're saying, you know? So, uh, no, I've been for very, very fortunate, and I've applied it at H Cal State Hayward, and then I moved to the rival school, Davis. We won a national title, no scholarships. I was told you can never do it. Had three different doubles teams in a row, all from the same team, win national championships, wow. national singles, and went to San Diego State. And it's, is it Coach Nelson? Hell no. I stole everything. <laughs> I apply these skills that are time-tested for a couple thousand years. And all the techniques that didn't work when senses were teaching, in the old days, they die with the sensei and all the students. So I know without a doubt it works. But to be honest, not everyone buys into it because of our culture today and the ego and the image and the selfies. And it's like, I'm fighting more the culture than I am what I'm, you know, getting people to buy into what I'm teaching. Uh, so. so, so why is it so hard? This is a big question too, intentionally, John. So feel free to take it, you know, in, in whatever direction, you know, you want to take it. But, uh, why is it so hard? for or or what is the hardest part of letting go of that ego when you when you have a new player that joins your team right a new a new person a new body a new spirit that joins your team 
what is the, the thing that you often find being the most challenging for that individual to let go of their ego, especially when it comes to, to practice and discipline and these, these principles we're talking about? You know, I think it's the culture of how they're being raised today and the image of selfies. I mean, Facebook, I mean, the people that invented it talk about how unhealthy it is. And some of the top people in this area don't even let their kids use it. It's like the selfies here on having fun. Look at me. It's like I have a friend who got a doctorate from Stanford in psychology. He went through the doctorate program that faster than anybody, Danny Dickinson. And he told me, he talks to the team, he goes, you know, everyone's always thinking, everyone's thinking about him. He says, Hey, Josh, I haven't seen you for a while. I run into you on the street. Hey, how's life going? How's everything going? And no longer than 20 seconds after I turn my back to walk away, I got to go to the grocery store. I got to pick up dinner for my wife. I got to go to the cleaners. Life moves on. People aren't thinking about you. Get over it. And all these selfies and look how much, look, look how successful, look how happy I am. You know, trust me, they're not that happy. They're trying to convince everyone there are. We're all given gifts. We all have a purpose. So tennis, all it is is a vehicle for learning about life. And there are some people that will make a living at it. But there are some people that, let's face it, to make a life on the tour, you got to be a little selfish. you got to be a little focused on what you're doing. And obviously, they excel at the top level. It's not for everybody. So for me, fighting the culture of, images and look at me, look at my six pack, look at this, this, this. It's like, hey, stop stop worrying what people are thinking about you. And you know, everyone's got their own life. I, I I'm big on integrity. Hmm. The you know, and you can't kid yourself. You can try to kid everyone else. So I do a tremendous amount of mental mental drills. And the mental drills really help the guys because talk, talk, talk. I'm an older coach. I've been coaching, you know, when it comes to college, this next, or I mean, uh, tennis coaching, and this will be my 40th year, 35 wow. at the NC2, and I will start my 36. So I've been blessed, but you know, I mean, I love what I do, but it's just about learning that mindset. Uh, Carol Dweck from Stanford, who wrote that book, Mindset, mm-hmm. it's how, uh, unhe- how unhealthy it is. Worry about results. The mindset is growth, mi- growth mindset, which the martial arts teaches. You know, I would say I'm better than I was. I'm not as good as I'm going to be. And that's the mindset. Don't rest on your laurels. Don't rest on what you've done. It has nothing to do with what you're about to do. And every university I've been at, it's forced me to learn, to develop. If it's recruiting or fundraising, whatever. But starting at the lower levels, the high school, community college, being as competitive as I am, I learned very, very quickly that these guys don't have it as opposed to saying they don't have it. How do I develop them mentally or technically or physically or how do I develop the strategy, right? So I treat, create an environment conducive to learning like any dojo. And you go to any dojo and you see a lot of fear. I'm afraid, afraid to try this new technique because I'll get my nose broken or my <laughs> arm broken. Well, I'm not going to try that new technique. But I have a friend who says, hey, Really good technique, you know, on that choke. If you just came in here toward the carotid and slipped up, you know, start toward the trachea and slide on up, that's a better technique. And that's what good dojos do. And obviously, when you're really competing and fighting, they're not talking to you. But 99% of the time, it's, hey, good technique, this could be better. So can I ask you what art you studied? I, sure. I studied uh, Shaolin Kempo, which is a derivative of Kempo Karate. Oh, yes. Well, I had a friend to study that and absolutely love it. I always pick everyone's brains and I was sparring with him one day and he was I was being aggressive, which is my nature. <laughs> he kept retreating, retreating, and then he, he did a spinning rise uh, back kick up into me. Mm-hmm. And it, he looked like he was towering. And I thought, oh, I got this guy. And he lifted me up to the ground with all of his sidekick. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I like that one. <laughs> so live and learn and you know the bruises and broken bones and stitches all heal but you don't forget those kind of lessons <laughs> it's like you know no. that's what i love about the martial arts i tell them if every single time you make a mistake i get to punch you in the face how many mistakes are you gonna make <laughs> and some of these guys will make mistakes over and over and i go you know the definition of his insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome 
you know, and immediate feedback. Heck, that hurts. Don't do that anymore. You know, I mean, that's how you learn. So, so but today you'd be sued and fired if you did that kind of stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that we have a special offer just for you guys as Omni Athlete Podcast listeners. You guys rock. You are some of the most engaged members of this community. And as a reward, we are offering you guys a 20% discount on your tickets to this year's Sports Energy and Consciousness Festival. 20% off to join me and the entire Sports Energy and Consciousness team, including some incredible presenters, Olympians, former professional athletes, healers, spiritual teachers, coaches of all levels are going to be joining us this year in July in San Rafael, California for the Sports Energy and Consciousness Festival. And because you guys are the community that makes this all possible, we are offering you guys a 20% discount on your ticket to the festival. Just go to sportsenergyfestival.com slash registration. And when you click through that, you'll go to Eventbrite. You'll have a chance to put in a code when you get your ticket and the code to use is Omni Athlete. Use that code. You've got 20% off your ticket. I would love to see each and every single one of you guys there because you are what has made this possible. Both Omni Athlete and the SEC group. The work that we are doing is possible because of the engaged, energized, and truly inspiring community that you guys are part of. And as a thank you, we wanted to offer this special discount to you guys and hope to see each of you at the 2018 Festival, July 13th through 15th, San Rafael, California. Once again, the special code is Omni Athlete. Go to sportsenergyfestival.com backslash registration. Hit and get your ticket. And then when you're at Eventbrite, click the promo code Omni Athlete. Use that code, enter it in, and you will get 20% off your ticket. See everybody there. Let's get back to the show. John, what do you mean by an environment conducive to learning? And uh, the reason I ask is because I think a lot of times, maybe not within the context of sport as much, but I do think culture at a larger level, when you say conducive to learning, what I could see a lot of people interpreting that as, as an environment that, that is soft, happy, easy go lucky like there there's an energy to it that i i don't think that's what you're talking about but i perceive that a lot of people could see that as the case because so much of our culture is shifting away from some of what you just illustrated that the martial arts and sport have the ability to teach us so what do you mean by an environment conducive to learning an environment and conducive learning is an environment where you're encouraged to do the right thing you're gonna fail and if you're not failing you're not learning and a lot of the mental drills. When I was at San Diego State, uh, I was coaching a German who came in. Who He was told by the coaches in Germany, you will never become a tennis player. He had been going to school in Germany. He was 23 years old. At that time, he was going to school. You're never going to be a tennis player. You know, get your education. Well, he came in. He went to UCLA, Pepperdine, a lot of schools. And I happened for the first time ever. I had the owner of the Padres, John Moores a blessing step up and help me out. I had two in-state scholarships and then he doubled it. I went to out-of-state scholarships. This guy came in. He was told he's never going to do anything. Well, guess what? I started working with him and I saw his strengths, his blessings, his, what his gifts. Well, he didn't believe it. He didn't buy in for about three months, but I wow. do a lot of technical development and stuff. So I'm on the court. You know, with 10 guys, I'm doing two hours a week of private lessons. That's 20 hours a week plus team practice. I'm out there all day. So I'm working with them. And after about three months, he goes, how coach? He was about 190 in Germany at 23 years old. And they go, how good do you think I can be? I go, well, Alex, you you have the talent and the potential to be top 100. Well, he kind of thought about it and go, okay, I'm 190 in Germany and maybe 100 in Germany. That's, That's not bad. That's pretty good. There are a lot of good players. The more I talked, he realized I talked about the world. He just laughed. He goes, Coach, you don't know anything about tennis. <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it because successful people tend to be very stubborn, you know. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And I laughed. I, go, I didn't say you're there now. I'm telling you, you have that talent, that potential. Well, he bought in. He went on to play Davis Cup for Germany. 
Wow. He was ranked four in Germany. He beat Nadal after Nadal, Nadal had a 24-minute win streak. He beat the Bryan Twins, the most successful doubles teams in the world of all time. And he made top 100. So the day he made 89 in the world, I called him. I told I told you so. He goes, I knew you were going to call me. But <laughs> I was talking one day with the team, and I said, we're doing a seven drill today. You got to hit seven slice serves in a row. Once you've done seven, you're done. If you miss, you start over. Then you got to hit seven toss and kick serves in a row. And once you're done with that, you move to the next one. But if you miss, you start over. Finish with seven flat serves. And Bosky, who is very strong willed, coach, coach, oh, I'm going to go after it. I hit my serve at least 130 miles an hour. I'm going for it. I might miss one. And I looked at him. I go, Alex. Alex, and he said that in front of the whole team, kind of challenged me. I don't mind that because uh, he had backbone, and I respect that. Successful people, you push, they push back. Sure. And I said, Alex, can you hit one flat serve in? And he looked at me, yeah. I go, that's a secret. There's only one. There's only one. Make a mental and physical commitment before, during, and after. Well, he now – uh, he's he's running one of the top academies, the Schut Lubowski Academy in Germany. But his record is 28 flat serves in a row. And people don't realize how tough it is. That all of a sudden the ego, hey, I'm going to do seven. I'm going to do 10. It's like, no, make a commitment mentally and physically. There's no, there's, this is not the 20th one. This is only number one. Do what you should do. And we do a 20 overhead drill. We do a 20 volley drill. If you miss. You get slapped around. You don't need a coach telling you, hey, you got to be 20 volleys deeper in the service line before you can move on. You got to hit 20 overheads in a row. You got to hit the sevens. And once they get to seven, they do 10, whatever. Right. But the discipline is do what you should do. Stop worrying about what number it is. There's only this one. That's it. Number one, this, you're in the moment. No future. This is 19. It's shocking how many people miss on the 19th or 20th overhead. Or on the seventh serve because the ego's involved. I'm going to do it. I'm going to, hey, you didn't get there by thinking that way. You got there by just doing what you should do every single time in the best of your ability, making a commitment before, during, and after. And in tennis or martial arts, if you start looking or towards results or looking at the future halfway through, you're done. I'm a golfer. Golf is mental health for me. And, uh, <laughs> oh, but where'd the shot go? And you can't look at it. You make a commitment, finish what you started. In techniques, you better finish what you start. Mm -hmm. And when you're throwing someone, if you bend from the waist and lose your balance, our sensei used to hold on to our gi. And as you threw them, if you bend from the waist, they'd pull, or they'd pull your gi down and kick you upside the head. Now, they want to try to hurt you or knock you out. But you learn real quick when you throw someone, regain your balance, guard against the kick, move to the next technique. So the training is relentless. Yeah. And at every level, there is another level. And once you're content, you're done. So, so I'm sure you found out in your training too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and I am, you know, John, I'm continuously amazed at the the lessons that martial arts brings into my life that I didn't appreciate, you know, in the heat of my training and, you know, and just the, the impact it's had on performance much, much more so than just physical, right? I, I feel very fortunate as I'm sure you can attest to, there is a physical uh, awareness to my body that I don't think many athletes have. And, and that's a result of martial arts training, but there is a mental and spiritual awareness that I don't, believe most grow up with. And I feel very fortunate that it came through the martial arts. And I guess my, my question to you would be, you mentioned this before, and I think it'd be really fun to explore a little bit more. What can tennis teach someone about life? And for you, what does sport teach us about life? Well, obviously, uh, number one, like in tennis and golf, integrity. You don't always, until the finals of conferences and nc 2 8 you don't have umpires on every court. And today, everyone's worried about winning. It's shocking the amount of people. Tennis has changed and the amount of cheating that's going on, the unsportsmanlike conduct and the fans trying to interfere and in talking you know, to people to distract them. And I tell people, integrity is all you got. And once you give you know, fame, come and go, money. If you don't have integrity, you don't have anything. And you can't kid yourself. 
if you cheated your whole life and all of a sudden you got it, you cheated your way in, now you got a wild card in your tournament, now there's umpires, well, guess what? You don't believe in your heart you're worthy and deserving because you cheated on how many big points to get there. So, you know, it teaches integrity. And it teaches you sometimes we learn more in life when we fail than when we win. Yeah. You know, I tell everyone, I, uh, we try to win every single point. Every point, and that's so hard to do. Every point is match point. Do what you should do every single time the best ability. Well, hey, this isn't working, so I have nothing to lose. If I keep doing this, I'm going to lose. So it, it takes courage to leave your comfort zone. You know how many people in life don't want to leave their comfort zone? Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're, this is what I do. This is me. Well, this is you when you were 10 years old. You know, two plus two is five. Well, guess what? It's not. Get over it. Move on. And you know, in the martial arts, I know you know this. When you're sparring, there's a certain amount of fear. When I slip your punch and I use my obi, the belt, to wrap around your neck and throw you back to back, and if I don't spin you properly, I'm going to pile drive your head in the in the mat, the, the Tommy mat. There's a certain amount of fear, but there's a certain amount of trust that you're going to do it correctly. Absolutely. So, one overcoming fear, and most people are inhibited by fear. But guess what? If you've ever been in the martial arts, there is fear that one of the unknown of getting hurt. But guess what? That's what toughens you up. And it's like, hey, we go to a dojo, we'd work out. If there's no blood on your dojo, you didn't work out. It was either yours or someone else's. It's not that you're being mean, but, you know, things happen. It wasn't malicious. It was never trying to hurt someone. But, hey, guess what? It's combatives. It's. When I was at UC Davis, I started their jiu-jitsu program. I taught all the self-defense classes for the women. I had 40, 50 women in every class. I had the whole wrestling team used to come into my jiu-jitsu club. And let me tell you, wrestlers are really, really tough people. And I loved it. I loved having these people because they were tough. They had a winning attitude. They were not afraid to mix it up. And as, I think it's Tim Lasik, but he literally was uh, the coach, and I happened to watch wrestling practice one day, and he says, hey, he goes, hey, coach, you know, I appreciate you working with these guys. They're having a great time. You mind if I ask you some questions? I said, no, not at all. So he started asking, what are you going to do if I grab you like this? So I showed him. I kind of took him down easy. He looked at me indignantly, and he goes, he's a big guy. He's bigger than me, stronger. And he looked at me kind of indignantly. He goes, hey, I could take a fall. Do the technique. So I took him down. Well, I moved to San Diego State, not even 10 years later. I saw this guy, he was a coach of MMA, and he used to fight in the Tough Man guy uh, contest in Sacramento. You know, I used to work when I was, in, when I was running the martial arts program, jiu-jitsu and the self-defense. I used to work with a group in a garage that were policemen, bouncers, and they did a tremendous amount of what-if scenarios. What am I going to do if you put a knife up against my throat and you trap me against the wall. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with this? And I loved it because they challenge you outside of your company. And I go, I don't know. Let's see. And you start learning. There is a solution for every situation. And if you haven't trained for it, you don't look for it. And once you're trained in tennis for the slicer, the kick serve, the white, the low, the, whatever it is, there is a solution. So, the environment has more to do with learning because if I'm going to get ridiculed by you because I do the technique wrong and I get punched or I get thrown after I throw you, you hold on and throw me over you. I'm not going to want to do it, you know. Ego's a funny thing. The bigger the ego, less learning going on. you got to almost like Bruce Lee said, empty your cup, you know, become a white belt. My sensei really pushed me once I got my first degree black belt to go study. And I would Aikido, I did Shokan, I did Judo, did Kali. And I entered every one of them as a white belt. Never he told people, hey, this is what I do. And I wanted to see what they taught. I started realizing there's certain fundamentals of balance, movement, connection in front of the body, you know. And problem solving. Hey, you want to do this? So I'm doing this. So no, I've been blessed. I get to do what I love. I get to, now San Diego is beautiful. Davis, Hayward, they're, you know, California. I've been very fortunate. Now I'm stuck in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> 
So one of the, the, the final questions I have, John, is, is you've mentioned the word purpose a lot. And I think it's, I, I feel the energy behind it when you say it. And I wonder if you could both share with our community what, what you see your purpose as, as a, as a coach, as a leader, as an athlete, whatever that may be. And then also, what does identifying that purpose have to do with peak performance? My purpose, I started tennis late. I've been in um, baseball seven years. I did wrestling. You know, uh, I played soccer in seventh, eighth grade. I was in a lot of sports. Um, when we started to get it, my twin brother and I started getting the martial arts, the sensei would take us to the Los Altos uh, recreation classes. And we used to be assistants. And there'd be a kid's class and an adult's class. Well, obviously, when you're 14 years old and an adult's gra- a big man's grabbing your wrist, I'd be trying to demonstrate because their ego's involved and they're proud and they're grabbing your wrist. Well, it wouldn't work at first. And Sig would come over, hey, John, do this. And he, he literally taught you how to do it correctly. So we got instructor's trophies. The first time they ever gave it to anybody at the dojo, Nico Jiu-Jitsu School in Mountain View, basically, it said we were, my twin brother and I are most likely to become instructors. Well, we went to Stanford, got, both of us got masters in education. They filmed me, and we were always positive. We'd always start with, hey, here's, our, here's, our, here's what you want to learn. You know, we always stayed positive, which our sensei always did, always solution. And my gift was, you know, from my life, I learned, I was told, you know, I started tennis so late. And in college, my junior and senior year at Division Two, the coach was a former baseball coach, didn't do technical or mental, but his attitude was a winner. Hmm. And all of a sudden, I said, John Nelson, All-American, sounded good to me. And at that time, University of San Diego, Irvine, all these, Cal Poly, Davis, all were Division Two, But something about it sounded good. So I set the goal, and I started keeping a journal. Mm-hmm. And if someone said an unsolicited, un- unsolicited comment to me about, hey, um, man, I can't read your server. Man, your volleys are awesome. Whatever, I'd write it down. And I started coaching myself, what would an All-American do with this situation? Well, if obviously you back off, on a big point and try to chip a return fear. I either miss it or they would never miss a volley. If I try to hit a winner, that's a hit and hope. So I started learning. I coached myself. What would an all American do? This is a match point. What would they do? And when I finished, I made the uh, quarterfinals. They took six of the eight singles quarterfinalists and the winning doubles team, eight of us down to Mexico and Kent DeMars, who coached Seguso and Flack, number one in the world in doubles from Southern Illinois, Division II school, and the Hampton coach, who dominated Division II for many years, went on to, at, at Division One. They were my coach. And I started realizing, good Lord, if, starting late, not having great technique, but if I could do this with my mindset of balance, and I always learned to fight my strengths against people's weaknesses. That In fighting, that's all you do. You don't look at them, they're 50 pounds heavier and bigger and stronger, or they're a wrestler, or they're a boxer. You fight a boxer as a boxer, you're done. <laughs> you fight a wrestler as a wrestler, you're done. They excel at their sport, but every, every style has a weakness. So we're very, I, my sensei, people come in to fight my sensei because I had a gung-ho attitude. He always say, hey, John, you want to fight this guy? Okay, he's a boxer, or he's this. And it would help me. Okay, I'm not standing toe to toe with these guys because they hit like mules, and they don't have, they don't mind brain cells dying. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I didn't want to stand toe to toe with any boxer. I keep my keep my distance with my legs. As soon as I could, I get in the clinch in boxing, and they separate you in jujitsu. Heck, yeah, we're taking you to the ground. We're going to choke you, armbar you, strangle you. We're sure as heck, it's not a macho game. It's winning. So my background is, I thought to myself, if I can do this with my mindset, the balance, at a friend, uh, former player, Mark Segesta, who won, three years in a row won, uh, made it to the singles final, won the singles, won the doubles. He beat guys 4 and 11 in Division One. He's 5'9", Division Two non-scholarship, <laughs> but he bought in. He was with me for five years, kept journals, redshirted his first year. 
And it, it made me as a coach realize if I could do what I did with my mindset, my attitude, my focus, and I teach people proper techniques, the applied physics, because physics works every single day, no matter where you are in the world. So I teach the guys, do what you should do every single time. And if you're not applying their proper physics, if you don't set up, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> you, you know, it's just the way it is. <laughs> so I think my background, uh, the martial arts starting late, not having, a, I was very fortunate, Rich Anderson at Kenyatta College he used to win the state title almost every year with Tom Chivington. They had the best teams. He did the technical, mental, physical development of players. And the, the teachers there, they expected A's, but they weren't going to give you anything. Hmm. Rich used to make, had everyone read the book Psycho-Cybernetics, Maxwell Maltz. And the sports, it basically got into sports psychology, but someone would have a nose job. He was a uh, plastic surgeon. And some people, it would 100% change their outlook and attitude in life. Other people harbored the old attitudes the old perceptions of themselves and it wanted to change it. And that's, if you read the book, psycho cybernetics, Maxwell Maltz, it talks about so much your perception, your outlook, your attitude. And I shy away from people that have huge egos hmm. because ego, the old thing, pride cometh before the fall. Hmm. You know, if you have a huge ego and you think you know it all, guess what? You don't. You know, the more you learn, the more you realize how much you don't learn. You learn the martial arts, no matter how good you are. First degree black belt basically teaches, tells everyone, well, I know the fundamentals. I know how to punch, kick, elbow, knee, head, butt, throw, choke, strangle, armbar, whatever. Right. That's the basics. But wait a minute. Now I got someone who doesn't want that to happen. <laughs> and then learning how to teach it. And one of the things nice about Kodokan Dazan Ru is you're teaching. And I've had so many of my athletes during the summer when they're teaching at clinics or camps have come back and told me, man, this is really helping me because I keep telling people the things I hear. I've had guys 35 years ago that played for me and they pissed at me because every time they go in the court, I still hear you talking to me. <laughs> you know, that mind, you know, I'm always on them. Set up, set up. If you don't set up down the line, you don't look like you're going in the net. You know, and you're not hitting the ball in your power zone. Don't worry about it. You know, if you, if you're not, if people don't set up, your power is not focused in the right direction. Like golf, try to be a golfer facing where you want it to go. You can't. It's applied physics. It, people get on an airplane, they bet their life on applied physics. You get in a tall building, you bet your life on the structural engineer. Tennis is a sport or golf. And it's like, hey, apply it. The physics is going to work. Stop worrying about it. You know, <laughs> and fear inhibits most people today, to be honest. It it does. And I, and I think that becomes such a recurring opportunity for growth for so many athletes and coaches and, and finding tools, as you've mentioned, just mental tools and frameworks that allow us to really push, push our edge so that we can, that we can really have a, you know, a new and, and heightened relationship with fear and understanding how it can serve us versus becoming something that inhibits us. Uh, John, this, so this is incredible. And, and there are so many pieces of wisdom and energy that you are, are sharing just with throwaway comments. I, I wish we could keep this, this going longer. How, uh, before I ask my final question, where can these guys go, our community, if they want to uh, connect with you online? Well, people can always email me. I, you know, I'm blessed. I love helping people. And so people can email me at the John Mills at Hawaii.edu. My uh, friend, uh, Mark Beatty and myself, for, I don't know, for 25 years, people said, write a book. Well, I'm busy. I love what I do. And Mark Beatty, a, for, a former uh, um, lawyer, he's been my volunteer. He's been watching for two years, and he's helped me write a book, Sensei Tennis. It should be out within the year. We're just about done right now. But it basically talks about everything I'm teaching. And honestly, I'm, I, it's not my stuff. It's literally what's been taught for thousands of years. As a Christian, I love people. I'm not a vicious person. It's not about hurting anybody. That's what I liked about it. It's problem solving. Now that you're fighting for your life, you're going to win because you want to win. But worrying about it and having the ego and tough guy attitude only causes problems. So, you know, people are always welcome to email me, ask questions. 
But uh, yeah, I I love helping people. I don't care. I've done golf seminars helping people. It's just a mindset. It's Carol Dweck's book, uh, Mindset. And she was a Stanford doctorate. And it's kind of cutting edge in psychology. Literally has changed the outlook on psychology. It's growth mindset, not fix mindset. Fix is winning, being number one, kick. No, no, no. It's growth. Learn. And you got to embrace fear. What do you do when you're afraid? You know, everybody's afraid. Everybody has fear. Anybody that says they're not fearful is a liar or they've never competed. <laughs> Everybody has fear. It's how you embrace it. It's how you feel about it. This is an opportunity. When I golf, I hit the ball in the trees and the guy, I'm doing match play and the guy's all excited. Oh, Nelson's in trouble. I say, what an opportunity to work on my recovery game, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it doesn't always work, but you see the shot, you try it, and you learn. Even if it doesn't work, you learn something. But if you're afraid to try it, you're stuck where you're at. You're never going to get better with fear. So I think learning to face fear, since it call you up and you do a technique, and it's like Torinagi, Tiger Tour, you grab them by the hair, you throw them three times by the hair, and you pick them up by the hair, and you throw them again. Then it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I can get hurt. This can... So as a fellow martial artist, you totally get what I'm talking about. It's it's such a great environment. It's a it's a camaraderie. I'm not against you. I'm with you. Let's go have fun. But I'm not better than you. I'm learning. I'm on my journey. You're on yours. I tell all my athletes, I'm in your life for a reason. Deal with it. <laughs> and if you don't want to hear from me, do what you should do, you know? And if you're not doing what you should do, you're going to hear from me. But we debate. Why are you doing this? Why don't you think? Like Bossy, he didn't. Oh, come on, coach. I'm going to hit my 730. No, no. Can you hit one? I can hit one. Okay. Then do it. Now I got to 28 flat sitters, and he was seated at the uh, U.S. Open in Dallas, you know, 12th in his last year he was playing. I mean, the guy, unbelievable career. And here he, here he is told by all the experts in Germany, you'll never, ever become a, a tennis player. And he went on to coach Tommy Haas, who was obviously unbelievably good. So, you know, I know it works. Is it my stuff? No. But, you know, I'm blessed. I get to do what I love, get to do it in paradise, get to help people. But trust me, I'm, I'm kind of relentless. And I know I piss the guys off because uh, it's not, oh, let's have fun, take your shirt off, get a tan, we're in Hawaii. It's like, no. What was your purpose on that? Was it you hit hard? End the point. Hit away. Those are all negative goals. Was it to hit a target? Every time you hit a tennis ball, you should have a specific target, a specific spin. Commit to it mentally, physically. You can't look up halfway through to see if it's doing. Hmm. So, no, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate. And Ryan Redondo, who I know you've interviewed, played for me. Uh -huh. he, he, after one year playing for a university, he came in, and his dad was a very successful coach. The coach he played for went on to win how what five national championships at USC. But he just felt a different type of pressure when he came in. I didn't put pressure to win. His uh backhand was gorgeous. His forehand was undisciplined, didn't set up down the line, didn't use the body. So right off the bat I said, You gotta get disciplined. Well, after a year, he literally told me, Coach, what's wrong with my back and his strength? Nothing wrong. No, no, I'm not. I can't do that. I said, laugh. And I said, you're not disciplined. Your forehand, you set up every time down the line, you hold, you can go anywhere. Your backhand, you have a great technique, but you're not set up. You're not disciplined. And obviously, he's been a very successful coach. He's had some great players. He's an up and coming coach. But uh, he won the, uh, the national indoor doubles title within four months of transferring, in, three months of transferring into my school. Because I didn't put any pressure to win, but I sure as heck put pressure to do the right thing. And he ended up making to the NC2A finals, lost in three co close sets in doubles, which was uh, in, in the finals to the team from Illinois. And that year, they won the singles, the doubles, and the uh, team. So, I mean, they were pretty good. And to be honest, they were beaten in the third set. They didn't lose. The guys hit unbelievable shots. All you do is, you know, in martial arts, you look, you bow to them, you look them straight in the eye, hey. Good match, good fight. Absolutely, so, and and 
Uh, John, there's so many, as you're, as you're talking, I can hear and feel the, the universalities, right. That, that flow th- from martial arts in, into sport and vice versa as, as it really is just a body and a discipline, right. Um, the, the final question that I have for you is a fun one. So we call this show Omni Athlete and it's called that because we are on the, the search for what it takes to be the ultimate mind, body, and spirit competitor. So the final question I have for you is, what does it mean to you to be an omni-athlete? Man, enjoy the journey. Yeah. Absolutely love learning. Be better than you were. You know, find your weakness. Find the area you, you're fearful or, and overcome it. And not only will you overcome it in the weakness, it'll help you in your strength. Because a lot of it is mental imagery and seeing it in your mind. If you see yourself in golf hitting it in the lake, you hit the lake. Don't hit it out of bounds. You hit it out of bounds. Don't miss. Don't double fall. You double fall. So it doesn't matter what don't strike out. It doesn't matter what it is. You literally are training your mind to go for it and see the positive. And, you know, the glass half full, glass half empty. And it's fear. What are people going to think about me? It's overcoming fear. Physics apply to everybody in this world. So apply the proper physics. And when you get so determined, the old saying, determination breeds concentration, you stop worrying about what people think. Just do what you should do. Am I better than I was? Yeah, I'm better. Hey, you're a winner. You know, but as soon as you go to the mindset of trying to tear other people down, they're no good. They're this, they're this. That's a, that's a losing attitude. Stop worrying about other people. Prepare yourself for the toughest golf course for the toughest tennis match, the guy's six, seven, hitting bomb serves. Well, are you trained for that? What's your solution? How do you play a big guy? Well, you hit the body more. You do this. How do you play a shorter guy? Well, you stretch him out. You get it high. There's a solution. And if you choose to look at it, it gives hope. And my friend, uh, Denny Dickinson, who I mentioned earlier, who got a doctor from Stanford mm-hmm. in counseling, the number one thing they teach is having hope. And if you don't have hope, you're done. As a Christian, there is always hope. <laughs> so, you know, as a coach, I give hope. I give solutions. It's a choice if they want to look at that. Wow. So, wow. John, thank you so much for, for being on the show, for, for sharing. I, guys, I reach out to John. And as soon as his book comes out, get it. And the reason I say that is you can hear both in literally his words, but also in his energy and, and the, the comments between the comments, just how much both, both wisdom and, and universal principles he shares and is connected. And, and I think what you will learn, the more that you watch, listen, connect with John and, and understand what, what he believes and what he is really on a mission to accomplish. It, it's that when we are willing and able to lean into our full capacity without fear and, and focus on what it is we're trying to accomplish, not what we don't want to have happen, but truly what we're trying to accomplish and the process around accomplishing it, that we can truly do anything as athletes and, and, and coaches. And John is a living testament to that and continues to be. And the energy he brings to it is absolutely incredible and very much so an omni coach. So John, Thank you for uh, being on on the athlete and for sharing this interview with us. Oh, my pleasure. God bless you guys. Thank you. What is up, Omni Athletes? Thank you guys for watching another episode of Omni Athletes. If this content is adding value to your lives, guys, please like and share and subscribe in every way you can. Share our content that helps us grow this community, which is really ultimately what we are after right now. So please like, comment, share, tell your friends about what we're doing. If it's adding value, please share it. And if it's not, tell us so we can really improve this content to make sure it's something that you guys want and want to see. Coming up, guys, in July, I'm super excited to announce we have the 2018 Sports Energy and Consciousness Festival. It's going to be in San Rafael, California. This is An absolutely incredible event for a lot of reasons. The main one being you get to actually engage with so many of the people that we've had on the show, so many of the leaders in sports, energy, and consciousness. The speakers are absolutely incredible, and the community is even more incredible. So I cannot encourage you guys enough. 
get to this festival. It is going to be an experience that transforms your vision of athletics, your ability to achieve peak performance, to find flow, to awaken an expanded level of consciousness in your performance that you just cannot find anywhere else. It's truly the tip of the iceberg, and you guys want to be part of it. July 13th through 15th in San Rafael, California. Go to sportsenergyfestival.com to get your tickets today before they run out. It, it's going to go quick, guys. Get there. Sportsenergyfestival.com, July 13th through 15th. We'll see you there.